I'm still here. <laughs> it's perfect. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor and a director and a producer and somebody who you remember from your childhood as playing bingo on the banana splits. We're very excited to welcome Terrence Winkless to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. How do you do? You know, we do a lot of, of B-movie drive-in film stuff because we always say we're broadcasting from a band of drive-in. And I'm always afraid, you know, whenever we bring a guest on and they've done one of these kind of movies that they're going to be like, oh, well, I don't know, those people are crazy because they don't like to be associated with their past. But, man, you're one of us, dude. You've done so many of these kind of films. It ain't funny. The first, the first movie I made, uh, I went. I had to go to a drive-in to see it. Wow. Out in the valley. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Those yeah, were the it days. It was about the, the cockroaches that took over the island. It yeah. was the perfect place to see it at a drive-in because everybody could be really freaked out. And, you know, it was great. You, you in your life, has had the best of both worlds because not only were you part of the drive-in era, but part of classic children's programming. And it's so sad. I mean, there's still Sesame Street, and they kind of do that. But there is nothing like there used to be back in the day and, and like when they had the banana splits. When we you, Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to uh, say... You mentioned Sesame Street very quickly. When I was a kid, I went to see a pal of mine in New York, my old buddy Jeff Bear, and he was uh, pals with Danny Segrin, who at the time was Big Bird. So uh. Big Bird and Bingo were drinking <laughs> beer together back in the day. <laughs> I, I do know that I found out on the forum that Bingo and Michael Myers, in a way, John Carpenter, you and John Carpenter were roommates. Yeah, yeah, we were roommates, good, good pals back in the day. Wow, you hung out with some good people. There you go. And you actually got to contribute on Dark Star, too, right? I did. Uh, uh, I get a credit as a production assistant, but uh, I did a little bit more than that. We did a bunch of reshoots, or he did a bunch of reshoots, and I was the guy who found the stage, and I sort of production managed it. But he couldn't really, you know, it was fine. It was a fine credit. I'm proud to have done yeah. it. Oh, it's a great film. It's too bad a lot of people don't know about it. They only know about Halloween and stuff. And But Dark Star is a great film. It's a dark comedy yeah. in a way. It, it, hysterical. Uh, it was Dan O'Bannon at his best writing. Right, for sure. Well, yeah. I wanted to yeah. find out, because we, we had kind of a debate on here, as to whether a bingo is an orangutan, a gorilla, <laughs> an, ape. A, an ape, a monkey. He's an orangutan, he, right? He, no, no, he's a gorilla. He's a, he's orange, but he's still a gorilla. Now, his, his character name in the show is Bingo the Gorilla. You see, I must have missed that. Cause I, swear, <laughs> I swear to God that because he was orange, it threw me off, and I kept thinking of orangutan. You, You've been thrown off since you were a child. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> it, it's it's the diabetes I got from eating all that cereal for watching that show. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It was doggone sweet stuff, all right. Yeah, there you go. Well, you know, it's got to be an incredible journey for you. I mean, you've done so many things in your life with so many great movies you want to talk about. But in knowing with the Banana Splits, there's kind of like a whole revival thing going on. And am I right in knowing that this was kind of started by Chiller and this get-together of the three remaining cast members? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we went out there in uh, October and uh, signed a lot of autographs and shook a lot of hands. It was an unbelievable amount of fun. And then this past weekend, we were in uh, in uh, L.A., in Burbank, at the beautiful Burbank Marriott. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was great. It's fantastic. I can't believe the this resurgence. And everybody, everybody who comes through is about 60 years old and is so happy to be there. <laughs> All these smiles, oh, yes, you remind me of my childhood, oh, my God, it's great, it's great stuff. It, it's we're, doing, uh, we're doing two more of them uh, later on in the year in uh, Colorado and Rhode Island. Oh, wow. And there are rumors of even more. Wow. And, and while I have a chance, and we're talking about this exactly, I've written a book about it, From the Inside Out, My Life is Bingo the Gorilla. Fantastic. Of the Banana Split. Wow. By me, yeah, yeah, soon to be out, out soon. <laughs> so is is this like a picture book? Is this like a tell all book? No, no. Or? I you know I I'm, I'm you, you, by the way in the list of the things that I've done the producer writer did, did, did you left out writer and I'm very proud of the fact that oh, I'm yeah. a writer and I went out of my way to sit down and write down my experiences as bingo and uh, and now it's a book. Wow, it has really come yeah. full circle. I, I think what really should happen is. Uh, 
well, Hanna Barbera, I guess, is owned by Turner now. But uh, it's too bad that they don't produce new banana splits with you three guys in it. Yeah, well, you know, what are you going to do? I, yeah, no, no, I do, wouldn't want to be back in that suit for anything in the world. You know, it weighed about 40 pounds. It was 40 pounds of shag carpeting. Oh. It was the hottest work I've ever done of any kind, and I've been to some very hot. I've been to India in the summer. Wow. I can tell you, being in a gorilla suit was hotter than that. So there you are. <laughs> so the, the, the suit itself, now you talked about the suit because, you know, it brings up a, a few questions. Uh, yeah. The, the bingo that we saw, was that the original incarnation or was there different revisions of the suit? Ooh, do you mean on the TV show? Uh, maybe before the show, like in pre-production or maybe even after the show I, started. I, I don't know what you're talking about exactly, but I'll tell you this. We, uh, uh, they created the show for NBC in the, in 68. Mm -hmm. We flew out to do the show, and this was the first time Hanna-Barbera had done any live action. Right. I don't know if they've ever done other live action. I'm not sure. In any case, the, the gorilla suit weighed about 40 pounds. Wow. No, it was not a dog. It was not something else. It was not an orangutan. It's called, after all, Bingo the Gorilla. And Flegel the dog and Drupal the lion and Snorky the elephant. That's right. Now, what I was getting at in, in talking about revisions of the suit was there any time during the run of the series that they change anything, uh, maybe inside or out, or what we saw was what you first got? Really, the, the only thing that changed was Snorky's costume. Oh, okay. It just sort of, they revised it so it would be somewhat more uh, something that Bobby Towers could move around in better. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the other revision was that they removed the guy who had been in it. Really, he, his main qualification for being in the suit was that he, it, it fit him. He was the right size for him. To be fair, he wasn't an actor. And Bobby Towers was able to bring a whole different dimension of, you know, this guy had been Snoopy the dog on Broadway or off-Broadway. So he brought with, a, uh, with him a lot of talent. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Snorky was shorter, so it had to be somebody that would fit the suit. That's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 now, yeah. That's right. From what I understand, I, I guess according to my notes, I don't know if you know this is true or not, that the actual costumes uh, were made by Sid and Marty Croft for uh, Hanna Barbera. You know if that's yeah, true? Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I did know that. I don't know if they've done other suits. So yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. Didn't they do HR Puff and stuff? Oh too? yeah, now, we've had all them people on HR Puff and stuff, Lidsville. Um, the, the only reason I know that is that we did a, a promo for it during mm -hmm. the course of our show. You know, we did it for a number of different shows, and right. that was one of them. So it was uh, Jack Wilde came on and did something. I forget which show his was. Puff and I stuff. Think that was H that's H.R. Puff and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm Jack Wilde sure. was great. Uh, now, the, the whole thing, how it started, like, did you, like, read a casting call in a local trade there in L.A.? Or <laughs> how, how did you get okay, to be Bingo uh, the Gorilla? Uh, we'll, uh, we'll confess to this okay. here and now, uh, <laughs> going out over all the, uh, the airwaves in sort of a fashion. In a fashion. Um, my dad wrote Kellogg's commercials uh, back in, the, in, in Chicago. Oh, wow. For the Leobernet Agency. He wrote Snap, Crackle Pop, Rice Krispies. Amazing. And, and lots of other things. And he, in the process of writing those things, Hanna-Barbera did the animation for them. Mm -hmm. So he got friendly with uh, Hanna and Barbera, Bill and Joe. And when it came time for them to do their live-action show, he says... I've got the right guys to be in your suits. And he met me and my brothers. My older brother was the dog. My younger brother was the lion. <sighs> so it really, was, it really was a family thing for you. You betcha. And how. <laughs> that is incredible. But, uh, we have a, we ha had a fourth brother, but he was busy and too big for the suit. <laughs> <laughs> he was busy li living his life. He's 14 years older than I am. So it, it was kind of a done thing. You know, I'm not going to say the word nepotism or anything, but I mean, it, it was a thing that you were pretty much a shoe and you didn't have to audition or anything? Or Well, we didn't have to audition, but we did have to, um, uh, I don't know, what we had to put up with a lot of, I guess a lot of other actors might have been willing to put up with the SAG weekly rate. Um, but it was it was a harrowing job. You sweat. You went through fourteen t-shirts a day because, as I say, the suit weighed 
45 pounds. Mm -hmm. It was made of four inch thick carpeting, and it, you really had to, you really sweat a lot. It was the, at one point, they contacted NASA. NASA, that NASA, wow. and 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 they built these things that they. If you froze a CO two cartridge and put it in this thing, it would blow hot air on your head. Mm -hmm. But the only problem was you had to wear it around your waist. Well, this show you spent all of your time falling down. Wow! Like kids, uh, you know, you're trying to appeal to children, you fall down like children, and you couldn't very well wear a thing around your waist because that's you know you're going to wreck your kidneys. So yeah. they became this sort of very expensive kazoos, which is sort of <laughs> we couldn't we couldn't use them. But we could play music on them. So. Wow! Now I, I've yeah. got to ask. You mentioned the word kidneys. Now yeah. I was I was on the set of Sony when he did the uh, redo of Planet of the Apes, and I'm standing there at the urinal, and the guy comes in with the ape suit because he couldn't get out of the suit, and he had to go to the bathroom. What happened, or what would happen if you had a bathroom emergency? Well, uh, they were. They very quickly became aware that we couldn't stand wear the suits very long. Yeah. So they would have people standing by right off camera, and the minute you stepped off, you could pop your head off, and somebody would unzip you. And we were younger, so you know we were a lot more in control of her. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lot more in control at 19 than you are at my current age. Right there, you go. So where was right. it filmed at? Uh, for the it episodes. was uh, it was all L.A. Yeah, but do you so, know what so studio? The romp, the, there's some romp stuff. Oh, okay. That is a romp was something that you know we sort of brokered the idea of uh, videos. Yeah. Um, they we shot them in um, at uh, Six Flags over Texas. Right. And there's an up so there's a place in uh, Cincinnati, Kings Island. Is Kings, that it? Yeah, Kings Island is exactly. What I was going to ask you about that. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we went to, to those two places to do this outdoor run around stuff. Now, Kings Island, both unbelievably hot places. Yeah. Oh, oh. My entire impression of Cincinnati is it's bloody hot. Yes. We're live, right? So I have to watch my mouth. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say bloody mouth and, and other things instead of other things. Well, well first of all, Sorry, you, you don't have to watch your mouth because we're uncensored, so it's okay. <laughs> but <laughs> but I definitely know what you mean about the hot thing because I've, I've done the uh, Halloween haunt thing and, and the wearing the suits and stuff. And, and yeah, it's hell. And, and what I wanted yeah. to know is you mentioned Kings Island now. I, I know you guys did uh, your intro and your outro, your wraparounds, whatever you call it. Uh, at Kings right. Island Six Flags, but I believe Kings Island in Ohio had the banana splits there regularly. Were they somebody else, or was that you guys too? They they must have kicked in after we had started shooting the show, and I think they walk around the park. I don't know, maybe yeah. to this day, I really don't know. But they would have kicked. They would have started after we'd been on the air, right? Because you know, what's the point of having us? In, or have those costumes until people know who the hell they are. Right. right exactly. So that's what. But I've, I, you know, I haven't been there since we shot there 150 years ago. So yeah. what do I know? Oh, it would have been fun for you to go and see whoever's playing bingo and just told him he's doing it yeah, wrong. Taunt him, taunt him, give him a hard time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, buddy, cool off. You're, huh? you're doing it wrong. I mean, your arm's supposed to droop on the other side, and you know, whatever. <laughs> Just give him a hard time. Right. You know, it was right. uh, mentioned as far as uh, in the forum was a good question. I thought uh, one of the forum members brought up uh, ab about the voices. Now there were other people that did the voices. Did you ever meet the person that did the voice of Bingo? I don't think I ever did. Though ironically, it would, my voice was Dawes Butler. He, my younger brother's voice was Alan Melvin, who had been on the the Bilko show, the Phil Silver show, mm -hmm. and my older brother's voice was Paul Winchell. Yes. He's a famous, famous voice Oh, he, guy. he is my <laughs> idol. I love Paul so there much. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Everybody knows who Paul Winchell yeah, is. Yeah, for sure. And he was Tigger, of course, too, for many years. And he was also the voice of the cuckoo clock in the wall, too. <laughs> it never occurred to me. Of course, that's right. 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 Right, I, I never knew that. Fifty years later, you <laughs> informed me of them. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, you informed. And Snorky didn't have a voice. He was busy emulating exactly. uh, uh, one of the Marx brothers. Yeah, he, I was going to say that he was he was Harpo Marx. I mean, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's it. How did, as far as shooting do your scenes go? I mean, how did that work? Was the voice track already recorded, and they would over they would play it over the speakers in the studio, and then you guys would kind of react yes, to that? Yes. 
they, they, they pre-recorded it, and we would, uh, we, I think we, we would give a listen to it before we went on camera, mm -hmm. and then when they rolled camera, we would try to move our mouths <laughs> with great effort mm -hmm. to what we heard. The sync was not exactly great. But, you know, it, it, it worked for a kid's show. What the heck? Now, Bingo's mouth moved. How did you do that? Uh, there was a long uh, piece of metal that went in under your chin. I'm doing it now to myself to try to describe <laughs> it. And you just open your mouth as far as it would go, and it would push. It, would, it was cantilevered. So it would push the mouth farther open than your mouth is actually able to go. Mm if you follow me. Right. Anyway, yeah. that's how we did You shove your chin down, it moves the mouth. It's pretty elementary when you get right down to it. I, I hear all these stories. Like, we had Jerry Jewell on, who was Cousin Jerry from The Facts of Life, and she did a Sesame Street episode. She was supposed to roller skate and, and accidentally crashed into Big Bird and knocked his head off. Uh, <laughs> was, was, there, was there any mishaps with the banana splits, like maybe the mechanism and bingo going wrong or something? Well, the, the costume was pretty elementary. And it's not as if something could go wrong with it, other than it falling apart. They were constantly falling apart. Yeah. You know, this thing, that show I just did in L.A., people come and say, so do you still love the costume? Well, we <laughs> couldn't keep the costumes together 50 years ago, let alone <laughs> now. I mean, are you kidding? And uh, they were constantly being repaired. Wow. I'll never forget the, uh, we had to pause in shooting and... Uh, Danny McCauley, that was the name of the AD, mm -hmm. was announced, Fixing the Elephant's Ears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought that was a gas. Wow. Um, and so nothing per se would go wrong with the costumes, except little things. Yeah. But uh, there were significant things that happened. For example, we drive those little banana buggies. Right. Or amphicats, as they're more properly known. All-terrain vehicles kind of things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those things, those things were always tipping over on us or screwing up somehow. I mean... Uh, I, I, I went at its top speed, uh, which is not very high, mind you, 25 to 30 mm -hmm. miles an hour, into a cyclone fence because I simply couldn't see it. Wow. We're out shooting somewhere out in the San Fernando Valley at... You know, you, you go, okay, boys, go as fast as you can. Nobody ever wants you to go slowly, right? Mm -hmm. It's the movies. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you that, gotta that's, go fast. that's the thing that people don't think about is, is I'm sure you couldn't see worth a damn in that suit. And my, they're, my, they're making my you drive. Eyes, my, my eyes were made out of the things that keep ping pong balls in. They were dark yeah. blue. And then uh, sunglasses that went over them. So I had about, I don't know, 30% of my vision. So I couldn't see that cyclone fence. Man, wow. there it was. <laughs> did, did you ever? It, was, it, it didn't. It didn't hurt me. My my younger brother Danny tipped over any number of times. Wow. In fact, some of the coolest footage in those those romp things mm -hmm. the, to the the MTV sort of style things uh, uh, is is the footage where he's almost tipping the thing over. Yeah. In fact, he got really good at it. <laughs> did you guys ever kind of say you or your brothers ever say hey i'm not a stunt man i mean <laughs> no 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 we had a too much pride and b uh too much pride there you and go we were getting paid well there and, and it, it's not as if it's not as if we ever did anything really dangerous yeah i mean i could do uh um uh, cartwheels in the damn suit. Uh, when I look at the footage now, I go, oh, God, how the hell did I do that? <laughs> but, you know, I was young and, and limber and strong and stuff. Now, the thing that was really cool, and, and it, it, you know, back in the day, uh, I was talking about earlier in the show, we had a producer of uh, Lancelot Link, and, and they had a rock band. The Banana Splits had a rock band. Now, I imagine you did those kind of MTV style. I guess it was somebody else that sang the song. You don't know who sang the song, do you? Uh... Al Cooper, Barry White, and and Gene Pitney. Uh, just as I say, I'm writing a book about this, so Fantastic. I will pause and look things up online. And all three of those guys recorded songs for our show. Isn't that astounding? Wow. Al Fantastic. Cooper, are you kidding me? Wow. Wow. <laughs> of course, Barry yeah. White is the big one with the ladies. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gene, Gene Pitney, a yeah. time without pity, Gene Pitney. Absolutely. So, like when when you guys did the numbers in that, it basically was you were playing to a track. I mean, did you really feel like a rock band? Did you want to get out there on the road and? Well, n no, it didn't really feel like a rock band. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, looking back, however, the guitars that they gave us, which were just props, were really nice guitars. Yeah. They were self-tuning. They were beautiful. And my brother and I, uh, Jeff and I, played guitar. Mm -hmm. So it was a gas to have them. I know Hanna-Barbera back we in the day. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Was, we never felt like a rock band. No, there was no urge to go out on the road <laughs> as a band of split band. We were just sort of, we're, you know, the reason for our existence pretty much was the monkeys. Yeah. I mean, if the monkeys hadn't existed, and the monkeys wouldn't have existed if the Beatles hadn't done Hard Day's Night, mm -hmm. There, I linked our show to the Beatles. There, I did it. <laughs> you can't beat that, brother. Well, that, that's um, a good reference because, you know, on online it says your show, Banana Swiss, was kind of like Rowan and Martin's laughing. But in a way, it's also the monkeys, too. It's kind of the, the mixture yeah, of them. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, it was a laughing for kids. Yeah. And, and we, in fact, we went on laughing and promoted the, our show. It was a sort of crossover. <laughs> yeah. I believe there was other kind of appearances, too. Like, I would see Banana Splits pop up now and then. Was that you guys, or was that somebody else? I can't even remember what shows it were. But. If, if, if it's in a TV show, it was probably us. If it, certainly back in the day, it would have been. We also went on the Della Reese show at some point. Wow. Remember Della Reese? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I'm an old guy. I remember, <laughs> I remember all there those. There you things. go. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, but really, that's it. Laughlin and Della Reese is all I remember doing. There might have been something else, yeah. but I don't know. Now, I've often asked people with Sid Marty Croft if Sid Marty Croft was ever around. Was Hanna Barbera ever around in your case on the set? Were they ever on the set? Uh -huh. um, well, we shot at least some of it on Bill Hanna's boat. Mm. Uh, there's a one of the earliest sort of musical number things shoots we did was out on Bill Hanna's boat at Catalina. That was great fun. <laughs> You cannot get you cannot walk around on Catalina Island unless you're very very careful for all yeah. the bat guano. For yeah. sure. Now I have to hey. ask, I have to ask you, Terrence, and and you can be completely honest one way or the other. But you know, one of the great things about the banana splits is that it has become a pop ultra, pop culture icon. But yeah. because of that, people like to try to use it in their own way. I know that the fan forum on Facebook uh, is is very against anybody posting about this. What was your opinion of the horror version of the banana splits that they came out with? Here we come now. I, I watched. I, I watched about I don't know fifteen minutes of it, and I said, "Why on earth would anybody try to make a horror film out of this charming kids show? Right. It was just a wreck." And on top of that, it was not well made. As a filmmaker, I could say that it was it was crap. So I don't know why they did that. I don't. I just don't know. They didn't even produce it here. It's produced in like Africa, Johannesburg, or something like that. And I guess they had to take it out of the country, or it would have been communism. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what they? Is, where did they make it? Do like you know? Johannesburg, South Africa. Yeah. Uh, that explains a lot, in a way. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let, let me Everything ask you, we, the rights have changed hands so many times. Like I said, I believe uh, Turner, you know, uh, Networks uh, owns uh, Cartoon Network and thus owns Banana Splits and Hanna-Barbera stuff and everything. Did you feel betrayed when they did that? I mean, like a lot of, like for instance, even with Sid and Marty Croft, who is still around, uh, a lot of their stuff has been redone and, and plagiarized, in my opinion, and, and just kind of molested in a way, if you will. Did you feel that maybe that's just something that it was disloyal to you guys that they just sold the rights like that to let them do whatever they let wanted? Me, let me let me let me answer it this way: When they uh, decided to sell, they bought us out. Yeah. When the rights went elsewhere. Right. And with that money, I was able to buy a Mercedes Benz. Okay. Oh. Does that answer your question? Do I feel betrayed, or do I had a did I have a Mercedes friend? <laughs> <laughs> I did not feel betrayed. No, that's life. That's showbiz. You know, right. you you do a job and you move on, and there you go. Right. Now the magic question I always have to ask people because I love people that that play the characters. Okay, the guy in the Godzilla suit was a hero to me, and so on and so forth. The witch you, suit. The, the Godzilla suit, like like anybody that's uh, yeah, in a yeah. suit, okay? Because yeah. like the old days when they had the suit characters were the best, even with monster films and so on. Uh, 
at the time you were doing the band splits, it was a big thing. It was a cultural thing. Even back then, it's even more so now. Now, of course, you're getting all this recognition, which is great. Back in the day when you were doing a show, were you really kind of ticked off that nobody knew that you were bingo? I mean, you're you're this big celebrity, but nobody knows you for you. <laughs> they know you for bingo. I don't remember being pissed off. <laughs> uh, and and my impression of my reaction to it was not uh, was not that at all. In fact, you, you know, because I was doing that show, I was able to make slightly better movies at USC Film School than people who were not lucky enough to be in the suit making SAG scale weekly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, uh, no, it was it was great. Uh, and I no, I do not feel any resentment for not having great fame out of it. Better it should come 50 years later now when I need it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you mentioned USC Film School. So one of the things that I read online, and, you know, sometimes what they say online is true and sometimes it's not, but I had read that when you were at USC Film School that you actually interned on the film Soylent Green. Is that true? That was actually after film school, but it is true that I did intern on Soylent Green, yes. My, uh, the, with a guy named, uh, the director was Richard Fleischer. He was a very nice guy. I learned a lot. Uh, and the the guy under whose auspices it all happened was Charlton Heston, yeah. who of course went to my high school in Winnetka, Illinois. Wow! And so it was all a very neat package. And we have the same birthday, Heston and I. Wow. We do not share the same attitude toward guns. Yeah. But uh, other than that, there was a bunch of linkage there that I was happy to. Uh, exploit. Now, see, you just made me happy. I'm from Illinois, and I didn't realize Chuck Heston was from Illinois, too. There you go. He's from Winnetka, brother. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that was and, Soylent Green. That was a great film. We had Lee Taylor Young on from uh, the movie, and a uh, cult classic uh, for sure. Great. Another cult classic that you worked on uh, that one of my listeners wanted me to ask you about is Gone in 60 Seconds. Now, he calls that a real gorilla film. And in a way, having you involved as Bingle the Gorilla as part of your life at one time is, is kind of appropriate. But that was guerrilla filmmaking, wasn't it? My uh, dad hooked me up. This is pretty good. It all links up together. Yeah. The guy, uh, one of the guys who edited the Banana Splits was a guy named Warner Layton. Warner left Hanna-Barbera and opened his own editing shop. My dad tipped me off to Warner. Warner hired me to be his assistant editor. And these guys kept bringing in this footage. The, you know, I'd sync up the dailies of these car crashes. And and I, I one day I said, where the hell does this, how does this all fit together? And they said, well, we don't really know exactly yet. And I said, I was an aspiring writer. Yeah. I hadn't sold anything yet. But I said, if you, if I'll write you scenes that set up your crashes, if you'll let me direct them. Wow. And Toby Halley said, uh, yeah, sure. He didn't exactly let me direct them, the scenes that I wrote, but he did, he, he listened to me when I spoke to him, aside from, uh, apart from everyone else. He didn't want anybody else to know that I had written these scenes. Mm -hmm. he, he had a lot of ego, and I don't blame him. He, he was a guy who had acres of wrecked cars and up and said, I'm not going to be a wrecked car guy anymore. I'm going to be a filmmaker. So we went out and started shooting these, you know, shooting this thing. Mm -hmm. So, as I say, I wrote the stuff for him. I directed some of it after a fashion. He, 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 you know, he hired all the guys in his shop. These are guys who, uh, down in Gardena, they take cars apart in the morning, and in the afternoon, they go in front of the camera <laughs> talk about what they're doing. Right. So they, they were not exactly actors. If he needed a car, uh, an insurance adjuster, he hired his friend, the insurance adjuster. Right. I literally could not get the guy to walk and talk at the same time. It was a battle. Nice guy, couldn't do it. Couldn't walk, couldn't talk at the same time. It was it was really entertaining. It was really interesting. And it, and it was my first time out of the box as a director. So... It was very interesting. Well, it was a great time too because that was back in the day of, you know, Roger Corman and people like that, and and they would give people like you a chance to where it's yep. not the, it's not that easy to do that now. You can't just walk in and say, "Here I am," you know. Back in the I, day, 
That's true. On the other hand, you can now go out with a uh, uh, a Nikon uh, or a Nokia phone and shoot as good a movie as what you could do on 16 millimeter back in the day. So you know, it's a it's a it's a trade off. Right. Right. Now, I was remiss earlier in not mentioning uh, you as a writer, and and shame on me because you actually really? got I yes. But you actually be careful. Bingo might go ape shit on you. I know. I uh, know. But you actually got your first writing credit uh, working on the Howling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did indeed. So there's how did an that come story. about? There's an amusing story there. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you're going to tell I, us. I <laughs> wrote with a partner for a long time, Alec Lorimore, a good friend of mine, and in fact, we're writing again together. Uh, but back in the day, we'd written a script about voodoo. And for some reason, it was in our friend's car. And my, the friend gave another friend a ride home. And he said, oh, and he looked at the back of the car and said, oh, here's the script by Winkless and Lorimore. Is it okay if I read it? So, yeah, it's okay if you read it. So the guy who asked for permission to read it happened to go to NYU, and he was pals with Mike Finnell, who was the producer of The Howling, mm -hmm. and he said to Mike, hey, I just read this good script. Maybe you should talk to the guy. So they had me in to talk to him. So the way to get your first writing gig or writing credit is to go out and play softball and be sure that one of your scripts is in the back of the car <laughs> when somebody else gets a ride home. Yeah, there's a, a very elaborate moral to that story. Uh. Anyway, thank you, Jack Sullivan and uh, Kevin Sellers. Boy, that goes back quite a ways to like 1980. Yeah, yeah we had a, an ongoing game out in Mar Vista. It was great for five years. We had, we called it the Writers, Writers and Models League. We had lots. It, 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 any actors that wanted to play could play. <laughs> <laughs> well, the it Howling was, was was like the last great werewolf uh, franchise. I mean, all the ones since then have been. It it, it came out at the same time and as uh, uh, Werewolf in London, John Landis's movie, uh -huh. which is you know it's just a very different movie. They, they took very different approaches. Joe Dante and Landis yeah. did to the same kind of material. So uh, I like what Joe did a lot. It was uh, he found ways to make it funny. You know, the, I've never met John Landis, but we know Joe Dante really well, and, and ah, he's just go. a great guy to work with. Did you find that that same experience? Oh, he's absolutely, yeah. he was absolutely uh, uh, always funny, always up, always ready to go. Whatever you know, whatever you needed. Let's say here's an idea. There's an idea. Uh, he wanted me to name all the main characters, which I did after guys who had directed uh, werewolf movies. Mm -hmm. Well, there was that <laughs> inside joke. That was a trip. All the yeah, fans that's, love that's that. Joe yeah. to a T, isn't it? Yeah. I, the only thing I ever heard about Joe Dante is we had Zach Galligan on uh, from Gremlins, and he said that Joe never really directed. He just said, okay, do it. And I don't know. Maybe it's because he envisioned him as a nice guy and he thought he wasn't directing when he was. I don't know. But anyway, he was. I. I I don't know. I didn't go to the set when they shot yeah. the the howling. It was up done in uh, up north, and I was down south. So, and I was on to my next gig, whatever it would have been. Now, a uh, one another one of your your really big classics, and and this oh, is a movie that will make you crawl, and and it's <laughs> called The Nest. Okay, I didn't oh, know that was you. Back. Incredible. It's, it's my first film. It's my first baby. Are you kidding? I love that movie. Uh, that has an amusing element too. Uh, Julie Corman, who was Roger's wife, right. wanted to initiate a first-time director into the into his first chance. So I uh, I was busy writing something for somebody, and I managed she uh, I managed to leave the house before I got the phone call, which would have told me not to bother to come out because I was because I was busy writing and she knew I couldn't leave the other job but I managed I was so excited about the idea that I might get this directing gig that I left the house way early <laughs> so I never got the call saying don't come out and mm -hmm. I was so enthusiastic Julie had to hire me so she did and that's uh, that's how I got the nest I managed to leave the house on time wow. but uh, actually I got that because my agent uh, the late uh, Peter Turner uh, set it up for 
for for Julie to meet me, and uh, the rest is history. But ask questions. <laughs> is there any? Was there any technical uh, problems with that movie? I mean, that movie was was really creepy. Uh, technical problems, um, not for me during the making of it. You know, the hardest part. You, 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 <laughs> you guys don't grow cockroaches deliberately. Right. And I, didn't, I, I, I didn't know this, you know. These people, with my, the cockroach wranglers, would come on and they're always looking exhausted. I go, why are you guys so exhausted? <laughs> don't you just grow them out in the valley? Don't you harvest them? He said, no, no, we're out in the streets of Van Nuys in the middle of the night picking up cockroaches by hand. Wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Are you kidding me? <laughs> really? So that's what they did, and they always looked exhausted. I'll never forget the kid, the, the son of the cockroach wranglers, uh, had an uh, ice cream bar in one hand and a handful of cockroaches in the other hand. I kept waiting for him to switch and forget which hand was which. No. It never happened. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Uh, the, but the my the problem the technical problem with that uh, movie was not mine. It was afterwards they fumigated that stage <laughs> for months. <laughs> I don't think they ever got all the cockroaches out there. You know they'll survive a nuclear holocaust. Well, and uh, go ahead. The first thing it's hard is getting them to act on cue because you know they. They don't care. you got to blow on them with a straw or whatever. And the next thing was finding actresses willing to work with them. Right. And do you have any <laughs> women that freaked out? I mean, you know. Uh, 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 the main girl, Lisa Langlois, was a little bit flipped out about it. She was, uh, she was having some kind of problems. At one point she said, I, my, my hands went numb and I can't hear you. <laughs> what does that have you hear through your hands? What the hell? <laughs> But uh, she had some problems with them. I mean, she had to be in the same room a lot. Yeah. Terry Trees, my the bad guy woman doctor, uh, uh, and who steals the movie from my point of view, um, she had no problems at all. Put your hand in this thing full of bugs, go for it. And my brother had to do it in the first uh, couple of days. He had to put his hand through a jar full of bugs and pick them up and... We put some of them were rubber and some of them, many of them were real. The ones that are moving, those are the real ones. Oh. The rubber ones that are standing still, those are stunt doubles. That's not moving. <laughs> so so you're, you're messing with real cockroaches and you're thinking, okay, yeah. when I first started out, I had to sweat my ass off in a gorilla suit. Now I'm messing with cockroaches. <laughs> Where is my career going? You know? <laughs> Yeah, well, eventually I got to do a, a very nice TV show that I lived in Marina del Rey, and the set was, uh, and we shot in Santa Monica so I could ride my bicycle to the set. It was fantastic, and uh, you know we were shooting that five days a week, and y you don't you don't do sixteen hour days when you're shooting union television. Yeah. Right. You're, you, and it was union, so it was great. No. So that was great fun, and I had another union show called um, 18 Wheels of Justice. You've never seen it. Uh, it was on the, the, the Nashville Network or something. We did it for only two years. It was great fun. And then we shot in San Diego, and that was fun, as I say, and it was DGA. Anytime you can work a union, you're ahead of the game. Right. Now, in case our listeners don't know... Uh I, I guess you kind of were destined to end up directing this one television show because you not only had a career in children's television when you were younger with Banana Slits, but then you later on uh, directed a film uh, called Blood Fist where you worked with you know Don the Dragon Wilson. Do you kind of yeah, feel yeah. like do you kind of feel like maybe that led to you being the director of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? I mean, if you combine the two. <laughs> I think, uh, yes, yes, that makes sense. <laughs> I did wind up doing, I did do Power Rangers after Blood Fist. That's right, I've forgotten the order there for a while. I'm glad you straightened me out. <laughs> yes, absolutely, there was linkage between one and the other. They wanted somebody who had done uh, karate movies because mm -hmm. the show, in theory, was all about karate. Ultimately, what they did on that show was they had a dedicated second unit, a stunt unit, because we, you, you can spend all day shooting just one fight, and they had tons of fights, and we had all these, in theory, 
drama scenes. You call them drama. It's people talking to one another. Mm -hmm. They're not very dramatic. But, you know, you've seen Power Rangers, you know. Mm -hmm. Come on, we've got to save the world. Let's go. <laughs> that, that, there, that's drama. <laughs> you, you know, I... Exactly I, I I think not I look exactly on it. Check off. Yeah. Not right. check off. Right. I think I look on it a little bit more fondly now with the uh, Power Rangers than, than what I did back in the eighties. But back then, I was kind of upset at the way children's programming was going because I was referencing Power Rangers to the Banana Splits. What did you think about how children's uh, programming was going in, in knowing you were working on the Power Rangers? Now, I, I don't want to say anything bad about it because it was an okay show and you were involved, but. I kind of like the old days compared to what they were doing, and then even it's even worse nowadays. I mean, what do you think of comparison? I, I, I didn't. I didn't think about it at all. I, I didn't know that uh, at that stage of my career that I was not going to be doing Power Rangers forever. What did uh, I know? Uh, um, you know, you take a, a a friend of mine who had shot another karate movie, ironically, Tom Calloway, told me, "Yeah, we keep shooting this stuff out." And he was from Texas. Uh, so if I fall into a Texas thing, I apologize, Tom. <laughs> um, but he, he said sh they keep shooting this stuff and shooting this stuff and shooting this stuff, and, he, and it turned out they were doing Power Rangers. And they, what we did was we did four shows at a time over a two-week period. So you would shoot this direction on this episode and this direction on this episode, you tried to make it so that you shot the, you kept the same direction going, but had the kids change clothes. Oh my God! It was a, it was a zoo. It was a, it was a Chinese fire drill, yeah. as they used to say. I don't know if you can say that these days, <laughs> but uh, it was great fun actually. Uh, I, I worked with the DP, a director of photography named Elon Rosenberg, and we had a lot of fun. We just cracked up a lot, especially when we shot. Bulk and Skull, I don't know if you've ever seen the show, but Paul, uh, Paul, God, what's Paul's last name? I don't remember. Jason Narvi and Paul Schreier, that's mm -hmm. it. These guys played Bulk and Skull. They were the bloody funniest people I ever worked with. They could crack me up. Alan and I could hardly stand behind the camera <laughs> and keep working because they cracked us up so much. Yeah. Anyway. My well, ode to Balkan Skull. <laughs> well, it's great that the Cormans are, are still around, and Roger, who just celebrated his birthday again, uh, as he does every year, gets older and older, but still says, I will never retire. Uh, one film you did for the Cormans was Not of This Earth. Now, that's a classic. Did we finish Blood Fist? Uh, Blood Fist, I got to go to the Philippines. If you want to see the world, make movies for Roger Corman. <laughs> I'm telling you. He sent me to Russia at one point. He sent me to Germany. At another point, he sent me to the Philippines. I went to India on my own, but that's uh, it wasn't on my own. It was for another movie, but it wasn't one that he was involved in. Yeah. What do you want to know about it, Roger? Well, yes, I was just... It's great that he never retires. Yeah. It, uh, it's fabulous. What about stories about Roger being chief? I mean, how was he with you? Because everybody always says they got paid. I'm waiting to hear somebody say, I never got paid. Joe Dante does it great in The Howling. He has, uh, I forget which character is making a phone call. I don't remember. But he's got somebody outside the, the phone booth, and the person stops, finishes his or her phone call and takes off. And then the person who's waiting turns around, and it's Roger. And the first thing he does is look in the change drawer of the old, you remember, old-fashioned telephone. Yes, yes, He looked in there to see if the, the dime had been left behind. Yeah. So Roger, well, Roger is notoriously frugal. I'm not going to say cheap. There you he go. just knew how to stretch a buck. And, and, you know, it's really a useful lesson to any young filmmaker. Yeah. You know, he has a thing where he brings you in and he gives you, even though I was working for Julie, his wife, he, he, she said, you know, let Roger give you his first time director's talk. And he has this series of things that he tells you about, including you should, if you like a shot and you, and you think that's good for you, you just say, that's good, moving on. And if the DP or the... Whoever doesn't like it, he has a chance to speak up right now. You'll see it in dailies, but if you like it, that's yeah. all that counts. Yeah. And uh, he teaches you how to be efficient. And, you know, people get on to this. People figure it out that you're not going to stand around. If you talk about it each time, 
you're going to waste 20 minutes. Well, 20 minutes is an entire other setup. It is. And when you're counting setups, you know, don't talk about it. Move on. The other thing that I I learned in that universe, especially which I still do today, you make shot lists. I write them down, I make drawings, terrible drawings that only I understand, and then I make lists of the, what I've drawn, and then by the time I get to the set, I don't even need the things that I've written out because it's into my head. Because, mm-hmm. right. you know, I copy it over, and then it's just me. I don't know if other people do that. Right. Well, in continuing to work with Roger, uh, uh, Terry had mentioned that you did in 1995, uh, Not of This Earth. Now, that became uh, yes. very, very, uh, did very well for, for Roger and, and Concord New Horizons. So what was it like doing that film? Um, well, you know, he had just done another version of it. Jim... Um, Jim Minorski. Jim, Jim Minorski, thank yeah. you. Uh, had just done it a couple of years before. But then he made that overall deal with Showtime, Roger Corman presents, yeah. and he needed uh, another one that he owned that was all ready to go, and now this earth is always all ready to go. It was great. It was great. And are you kidding? I got to work with Michael York, yeah. who had been, you know, he was nominated for an Academy Award for Cabaret or something. I, I may be wrong about that. Mm-hmm. But he was a real first caliber kind of guy, and it was unbelievable to me that he would turn to me and say, Terry, what's my motivation here? What am I? And this is a guy, this you know, he played Tybalt in in, in Zeffirelli's Frank uh, and uh, Romeo and Juliet, for Pete's sake. Right. So Michael York knows what he's doing. He's asking me for motivation. Oh man, I'm jazzed. <laughs> so uh, it was it was exciting. It was great. Well, it, I'm so happy that, that you guys are all getting together for banana splits, and and so sad that that one of your members is gone. Can you talk about that, please? Well, um, you know, it's uh, it's getting to be a while. It's my brother Jeff. He was he he passed away in two thousand six. And he played so, Flegel. Um, yes, he played Flegel. Um, um, I'm getting sort of used to it. It's still a drag. There's not a day goes by I don't think about him. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, there's any anything might remind me of him. Um, I mean, being your brother, you know, I'm sure you think of him every day anyway. But when you guys do your reunion things at like Chiller and so on, it's got to really hit home. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, it's very peculiar. It's it's he would have dug it so much. Right. You know, I mean, you know, Bobby's there and uh, Drooper's there, um, so you know, we, you muddle on. That's all you can do in this world. When you guys get back together, the three of you, what do you talk about? Do you talk about the old days and what happened on this well, day and that it, day? Or? It, 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 it's, no, no. There, there was never. Uh, in fact, I turned to Bobby just the other day, and I said, "In L.A. the other day, four days ago, whatever uh-huh. it was." Um, and I said, "You know, I don't remember any specific day shooting anything in particular, except for the Amphicats turning over on us. That I remember, but yeah. that's different from when you're on the set. You know, it all runs together." Right. Yeah. Um, um, I do remember Dick Donner was the director of it the first year, and he had a huge laugh. And nothing encourages you more when you're trying to get laughs than a guy on the other side of the camera laughing boisterously. <laughs> Donner had a great laugh. Right. And he's doing Lethal Weapon 5 or something. Upcoming, he's 90 years old. I'm impressed. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that cool? That is so anyway, cool. I, I, I think it's great. Well, it's it's hard. I gotta mention this. It's hard enough to to be on set and and be in your costume and it's so hot and everything and, and exhausting. And, and then they they pair you with these girls. I mean, what they sour grape bunch or whatever it was. <laughs> what was it like working with with these little girls who were really kind of cool? Yeah, no, it was great. I wonder whatever happened to them. I wonder if any of them went in the showbiz. They went out of the way to teach them teach them. The banana split, doing the banana split. Yeah, in <laughs> fact, I think that's the one that Barry White sang. Mm. Doing the banana split, yeah. <laughs> wow. I think that's on record someplace. Well, it's on uh, my anyway, record. They, they, <laughs> no, uh, it's somewhere uh, in the internet. Uh-huh. Um, they were fine. They taught them that dance. They came in, they worked, they went away. 
I don't know any of their names, but you know they were fine. It was sweet. So did they do anything like like I? You could, they're actresses. I mean, I'm sure they knew you were guys in suits, or did they keep that secret from them? I mean, did they bring them in when you guys were already <laughs> costume? Well, there's, you, you know, you can't stay in the suit long enough to work. I mean, they were there for hours. You can't yeah. stay in the suit more than I don't know five minutes. As I say, it weighed 45 pounds. It was yeah. brutal. I can't complain about it enough. I know I do. <laughs> but it it would, have been, would have been terrible if one of the little girls thought you guys were real, and then you'd go for a break, you'd take your head off, and it, <laughs> it would have been devastating. <laughs> that, would be, that would be alarming. But no, they were far more professional than that. They were, they were, they were troopers. What so, is some of the questions that, that you get at conventions now uh one of your uh fans on on the group and the group is great we've been promoting the uh, facebook group i know you guys come in there and answer questions and mm-hmm. stuff said the banana split saved his life now, i imagine you hear this a lot what's some of the comments you hear with some of the craziest questions you get what are some of the craziest questions mm-hmm. um oh man there's no uh, instant answer to this you know what? Um, you know, I have to put you on the speaker. I have to feed the cat. Okay. <laughs> no, the okay. cat must Sorry. be fed, yes. <laughs> Sorry, but Hello, America. I'm feeding the cat. Come here, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, feed, she, feed the cat some of that cereal I grew up with watching the banana splits. <laughs> no, the cat will never sleep. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so we're feeding the cat right now. Well, you know, the, the cats take precedence. Our it's cats, a, our a, cats run our house. It, so they do, and it's important to feed the cat. It is because if you don't feed the cat, they might feed on you. That's not, <laughs> that's not a good thing. Good. Okay. Um. Um. Most of them done. Here you go, cat. <laughs> there. I can take you up the speakerphone. So what, what's your cat's? What's your cat's name? Because we have to give him credit. Antimony. Oh, okay. Aww, very nice. We were just That's saying our, our our cats run our Thanks. house too, so it's 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 there understandable. <laughs> I think my daughter named her Antimony because that's some kind of uh, it's on the uh, what do you call that scale of chemicals? Uh, the periodic table. That? The periodic the table. The periodic yeah. table. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's right. So it, we anyway. were talking about questions and and wacky questions. Is, oh. is there anything what? they've asked you that you really couldn't answer or? Uh, you know, uh, one of the things I say on my somewhere in my bio, bio maybe if you want to know something, if you want to, if you want to know something, if you want an answer, make it up or something like that. Right. That's a good quote. I, I say I'm quoting my buddy Jaeger's dad, but he says that I that I'm full of it, that I'm wrong. Yeah. If you want to know the answer, make it up. Yeah, I'm quite sure that somebody said that. Some, and now I've. Uh, Purloined it for myself. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I don't have any specific questions that people have asked me about the banana splits. Okay. Well, well it's it's just enough that you're there. Right. Uh, before before we wrap this up, though, I did want to ask you. There's a couple of projects that are listed as being either in production or in development uh, with you on IMDb. Now, sometimes that's accurate right. and sometimes it's not. But I have to ask. So, what is uh, the two projects that are listed as I am and Calamity Jane? Right. Uh, I Am is a uh, really good uh, little suspense movie with two characters about a woman who suspects that her husband is a killer. And if she goes about trying to prove that he is, she puts her own life in danger. Uh, For a minute or two, it looked as if we had the financing, and now that fell out, and now we're looking again. I Am, all you investors out there, this splendid script easily done <laughs> almost all interiors so it's a very controllable thing with only two characters two wow. main characters nice. there you go. a couple of subsidiary characters and the other one uh calamity jane is on there huh i that uh, uh the other one oh god is there another one isn't uh what's the one i'm thinking of uh, calamity jane is on there i haven't there's been no action on Calamity Jane yeah, in quite listed, a while. Yeah, it's listed as in development. That's about it. Yeah, that's still looking for its next step. Okay. That's with some folks down in Florida. I haven't talked to them lately. So I don't think a lot is happening lately. But, you know, it's like you, you never retire from showbiz. You're just between gigs. 
and that thing hasn't found its money yet, but that doesn't mean that it won't. Right. Well, you talk about, you know, back in the days, quite a few years back, and the differences between you now and then as far as age, although I must say, you three look great. I mean, I, I was like, is that really them? They should be older looking than that. <laughs> I, I, I thought you guys should be like, you know, in a wheelchair. Or that, but Please, it, Seth, I'm not that old. I don't no. know what picture you're looking at. but uh, I'm only saying that because I'm the same age, okay? I'm, I'm from that era, there you too. Go. But I, uh, I, if they offered you some kind of gig, maybe a, a TV appearance or even an episode of something where you had to act, would you put on a suit again? No. No. <laughs> that was a very that quick, was quick answer. That was a quick no. <laughs> no. I'm too old. It's too painful. It's agonizing getting up and down the stairs in the townhouse where I live, let alone in a gorilla suit that weighs 45 pounds. Right. No, I've been there. I've done that. I'll be happy to direct an episode for you. There you go. There you go. But, uh, but that's about it. So and actually, the next gig I have is as an actor, which yeah. I never really set out to do exactly. I didn't set out to do the banana splits, but there I was. And I know I've got quite a long list of you acting do. credits for a guy who never really tried to do it. So I did one, the coolest one, though. So I answered an ad in Craigslist a few years ago, five years, and uh, it was for a guy about my age willing to go to India. And be the the father of the girl who's going to marry the uh, Indian, uh, right? The the American girl or Canadian, whatever she is, is going to marry the Indian guy. The father of the Indian guy and I don't get along, but by the end of the movie, we do. You know, it's a cross culture mm -hmm. comedy, right? A great little movie called Gaudian Nudafakaro, wow. which means which kind of means let's get rid of the white people, but it's not as hostile <laughs> as that. It really just means let's be ourselves yeah. and not care about, you know, uh, the British were in India for a very long time and gave them a very hard time, and now they want to be a be done with that. <laughs> let's get rid of the white people. Right, right. So we're doing a sequel uh, soonish. Uh, probably when the weather gets warm here again. Well, there you Let's go. See, which yet, is in the summer. Yet yeah. another opportunity yeah. to travel. Oh, actually, I'm not going. That one doesn't shoot in India. Only the promos are in India, and that's fine with me. Right. When, when I people don't mind shoot. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say when people refer you, you mentioned uh, about acting, saying you hadn't really done that too much. People refer to you in, in your banana split stage. You refer to yourself as an actor, don't you? You really were an actor. Well, uh, you know, is jumping around in a gorilla suit acting? Well, you know, you're not portraying a character. You're not digging in deep. You're not showing some kind of emotion. I mean, good actors are able to turn that thing on. My buddy Steve Davies, when I ask him, I try to put him in every movie I can so that I don't have to do it. I'm only kidding. <laughs> he, 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 he plays parts that, that uh, you know, he's a great actor. And he's, he's a chameleon, yeah. is what he is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really not. I, I can't turn it on that way. I can say the words. I can say, you know, had him off at the pass. But uh, I'm, I'm much more comfortable on the other side of the camera. Yeah. Well, I, I'll yeah. tell you, though, uh, you know, coming from me, and I'm sure many of your fans, we definitely thought of you in Banana Swiss Days as an actor because you spoke to all of us and made us all believe. <laughs> and, and well, thank you. I, I'm delighted I, to hear it. Even though I didn't know that you were a gorilla, I thought you were an orangutan. But other than that, you spoke to me. <laughs> well, it's the orange threw you off. That's it is, you know. exactly. That's yeah. It is. All right, well, the orange is not the natural color for a girl, after all. Yeah. Do you have any uh, banana splits uh, stuff around your place? I mean, dolls, posters, figure, or, or maybe the old original classic toys. I had the original Aurora model kit of, of the uh, all-terrain vehicle and with little wow. you guys. Wow. Put, uh, yeah. Ironically, only this last weekend did I collect uh, stuff. I collected a whole stack of pictures, the ones that we autograph when people come to these shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I grabbed that, and somebody gave me a little figurine, a little bobblehead, bingo bobblehead. And what else did I grab? Somebody gave me a, a 45 RPM record. <laughs> Good right. luck finding something that'll play that. <laughs> um, but so only just this last weekend did I collect a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I have some stuff. <laughs> well, we're we're very happy. We have in our vinyl record collection. We have the original Banana Splits album, which is very cool because the music really was great. And like you said, all those people that were involved. Yeah. 
So before, yeah, that's a good talent. Before we go here, uh, last question we want to ask, when is the book coming out? Do we know when fans can look towards picking up your book? I don't know when you can pick up, um, um, what do I call it? Uh, from the inside out, my life is Bingo the Gorilla of the Banana Splits. I don't know yet. Okay. I can't answer that question yet, but uh, I'll keep saying, from the inside out, my life is Bingo the Gorilla of the Banana Splits mm-hmm. by Terrence H. Winkless. There you go. Well, you definitely were Bingo, and it was history, and it was iconic, and it was pop culture. But let me ask this one last crazy question. I've got to ask this. I yep. always, this is yep. a question I've always loved to ask people that, that do shows such as yours. If you didn't play Bingo, what other character would you have liked to have played? Probably something in a western. I I I, I don't. Um, yeah, I like western shows. Well, I'm talking about banana splits. I, uh, what other banana splits oh, character? Oh, yeah. what other banana splits character? You mean yeah. if I weren't Bingo, yeah. would I want to be Flegel or Drooper or, or Snorky. Snorky? Or Snorky if you were shorter. No, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I played the right one. I played the one I should have played. Uh, Jeff, my older brother, was the leader. It made all the sense in the world that. He's the leader of the Banana Splits. He was the leader of the oldest of the three brothers <laughs> that were inside the suits. So it was completely organic and logical. It makes all the sense in the world. Right. You, you and got, and he, he was a real actor, unlike me, yeah. <laughs> as I keep saying. He really wanted to do it. And so and so did Bobby, the uh, the uh, elephant. Right. Well, knowing you guys no, are... No, I, I wouldn't want to be either any of the other three. Knowing you guys were all family and all this and that, uh, Thanksgiving had to be incredible around the table. I mean, <laughs> hopefully you acted. Yeah, uh, it was a trip. Yeah, a little a little less zany uh, than than you did as a banana splits at the supper table there, but <laughs> but right. I'm sure you've heard us a million times. Thank you so much for my childhood because you definitely uh, gave me a part of it that I will I will cherish. There will never be a show. Like the bananas. You're, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. You guys were incredible. You really were. And thank you for spending. I have a question for you guys. Oh, uh, sure. Is this go straight onto the website and I can listen to it? I. Uh, we do it. Uh, we record live while we're doing it, so there will be yep. an on-demand version of this. Um, but it'll probably it won't not be up for about twenty-four to forty-eight hours. Probably about twenty-four. I usually try to get them up right away. Um, but okay. I will send you a link to not only the entire show but also the interview segment as well, so that you can oh, share okay. it. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's, All on, right, great. it's on live, and then we, we take it and make it a podcast, and we have two uh, versions, one with the full show and one with just your interview you can put on your, your page or whatever. I see. All right, great. Terrence, thank you Thanks. so much. Thanks, i email. Yes, and thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. It was a pleasure doing it. You guys asked good questions, and you came prepared. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you again, and have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. All right, and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.